cheap gaming computer. This is the video you guys have been asking for for literally ages. And I think the cheapest gaming PC we've built in literally years, because what we have here is the gaming PC that in the UK costs around about 550 pounds. And in the US it costs Thank you very much, Carl. So I don't know about you, but this is obviously a really accessible price point. But obviously with cheaper gaming PC builds, you do get more compromises. And we are doing something a little bit different today because AMD have just launched a series of APUs. So these actually have a graphics chip built inside them, or at least a very good graphics chip, relatively speaking, of course, built inside it where you can actually play PC games at 1080p at settings. We'll find out a little bit later in this video at hopefully decent frame rates. So this is not going to be like your £1,000 or dollar RTX 4080 ray tracing build. This is literally going to see what you can do on a more modest budget, which when you think about it, for loads of people that just want to play eSportsy titles, you don't need to spend an arm and a leg to get really high frame rates, so why do it? As always, we'll be walking you through all of the components that we're using here today, showing you things we like, maybe some things that we definitely don't. And of course, we'll show you how to put everything together nice and easily and then show you those all important gameplay benchmark numbers so you know exactly how this thing performs. So is this the solution to all of our problems? Is this going to make a kick-ass gaming PC on a lower end budget or should you go ahead and get something else? Stay tuned to find out everything you need to know right after a short word from this video's sponsor. Gigabyte's Aorus 16X is here, bringing the best of PC gaming in a portable package. This gaming beast packs the latest 14th gen Intel processors with up to a 24 core i9 14900HX for unbelievable performance. Not only that, but with Nvidia's GeForce RTX 4070 and 4060 mobile graphics chips, you'll get up for ray tracing, DLSS super resolution, and frame generation. Get yours today with the link down below. So yeah, this is definitely gonna be a little bit of a build with a difference, but don't be too scared around these because they are actually very easy to understand. And obviously the principle is, I mean, the same with something like a PlayStation 5 or an Xbox, those use APUs as well. It saves you space, it saves you money, and as long as you've got the performance that you need, why bother with a dedicated graphics card? I will very strongly caveat though, by saying that the performance of this will be nowhere near as good as a proper dedicated graphics card, or at least one that costs a decent sum of money. But especially in 2024, as we know, graphics cards really cost a minimum of about £190 or dollars or so. So if you can get good enough performance from an APU, you're trying to save a bunch of money, then it does make sense. Now, I will say that the Ryzen 7 as well, this is the 8700G, only to me anyway, makes sense for more like productivity with a little bit of like graphics load. So maybe if you're a photographer, this is an eight core CPU, this is when this sort of makes more sense. But because it has a price premium over the one we're using today, which is the 8600G, I would strongly advise that if you are going for like a gaming PC build like this, this is the one that you stick to because it has decent graphics performance, decent CPU performance, but then doesn't cost an extra hundred dollars. And then obviously that's when you should start to talk about getting a dedicated graphics card. And I will say by the way, that I have actually had a lot of fun planning out all of the parts for this build. Because I think I've bought everything on this table bar the CPU itself that AMD sent out as a review sample. I mean, they actually provided like a $230 board and some really expensive 6400 megahertz RAM. This is not what this chip is for. I get it for benchmarking, not realistic. So we've gone for something a little bit different. This is an A620M motherboard, M standing for Micro ATX. Micro ATX obviously means we can get a smaller chassis. The main compromise really that you get with this is slightly less bandwidth. You're not gonna get any PCI generation five support, but I don't really think it matters. This, as I say, is the A620 20M Gaming X from Gigabyte, and it is going to look a little bit bare bones compared to what we're used to. But obviously, when you're trying to save every penny, you quite literally, I've never had a motherboard that's that difficult to open before. How strange. Fundamentally, as well, this is a motherboard that does have USB BIOS flashback or the ability to actually update the board without a chip. Because obviously, we're using a brand new CPU. If you put this inside there, I think it will have a freak out and it won't know what to do, which is why you will need to update the BIOS. But as you can see, pretty bare bones. We do have a little bit of cooling on some of the VRMs here. I wouldn't advise getting like a Ryzen 9 and putting this inside here, but 
To be fair, if you're gonna upgrade this to something like a 7700 uh, or any 65 watt chip at a later date, I think you're gonna have a good experience. Decent way to save money if you're trying to save every penny. So let's place our motherboard on top of its box. Then we can grab our CPU out of its container. There is also a cooler inside this. And I know there is a little bit of controversy at the moment because the Ryzen 5 doesn't actually have a massive stock cooler, which is gonna be fine for gaming. But if you're gonna do like sustained productivity loads on this thing, my understanding is that either the cooling is not quite sufficient or the way that this will sort of ramp up its clock speeds it's, it's not quite right at the moment. And as I say, over sustained loads, you could lose a little bit of performance, but I'm not really too worried about that for gaming because it's not gonna be running at 100%. Grab your AM5 CPU out of its container, then just drop this down into position, then lower it back down, click that into place, and then your cover removes and it's used if you wanna like send your motherboard off or something just to protect the socket. But now that that chip is installed, we have to move on to the first issue, if you like, with this build and this concept. And that is the fact that because you're using an AM5 motherboard, I mean, pricing on the board itself is slightly more than the competitors from Intel, but to be honest, it's not crazy. So I wouldn't get too hung up on that, but it does mean you're gonna have to use some of this, which is DDR5, memory and this is literally the cheapest kit i could find this is running at 4800 megahertz it's 16 gig not 32 but again absolutely fine for what we're using it here for this still cost me almost 60 pounds Whereas if you buy some DDR4, you can get some decent stuff for about 35 here in the UK. Which obviously, when you're trying to save every penny, around about like 20 to 25 pounds is a big difference. Installing it though is pretty straightforward. You just open up slots two and four, and then give it a good push down. Next up, I wanna take the opportunity to install our storage. And I will say that this is a slightly older drive. There's a newer one than this that I'll leave linked down below along with the parts for everything actually. This is the SN550, but the one I'd recommend is the SN 570 or any SSD really that has decent enough speeds, but obviously costs, well, not much. SSD prices have actually gone up a little bit recently, which is a shame. You could get them for like 35 pounds before, but I think you're looking at nearer 50 now. But you just wanna remove your little heat sink for the SSD, make sure you take the peel off on the back, then just line it up with the slot, push it down, and then just replace the heat sink that you just removed. And to be fair as well, this would literally be the easiest gaming PC you can build because there are so few parts in this and you don't have to muck about with like big hefty radiators, coolers, things like that. Not even a graphics card. So I'm hoping this could take you like 40 minutes to build. But anyway, I digress because it is time to actually install our cooler. And yes, there is not much mass to this at all, but you do get some pre-applied thermal paste. And as I say, this should be pretty easy to actually get installed. Just remove the default AM5 mounting hardware. Keep this in your motherboard box so you don't lose it. Then grab your cooler, line it up with your CPU. Then you wanna screw this down in a cross pattern to ensure that you're not putting any excess force on your CPU nor the socket. Makes a lovely noise as well. Once you've done that, it's just one cable to connect. This little gray CPU fan header at the top. Just hook that over the top and give it a push. And then I think you're pretty much ready to get this installed. I have realized that I haven't actually grabbed the IO shield out of the box, which is this little metal plate. This will go at the back of the case. Then you're ready to make yourself some room and start working on your case or the chassis. And this is from Cooler Master. It's the Q300L. You can buy a newer one that actually, I think comes with USB-C and is better built, but it costs almost double, which again, when you're trying to save every penny, doesn't make sense. But I don't like the fact that this comes with like a flexi plastic acrylic panel rather than glass. But you know, at this price point, it's not really going to matter. Just don't touch it with anything because it will scratch really easily. Other than that, it's absolutely fine. But I mean, to be fair, that doesn't really matter when all you're gonna do is build it. And I imagine the sort of components you'll place inside are gonna be sort of pretty power efficient anyway. So you've not got to worry too much about noise levels. You do get one fan here at the back. Again, make sure you tune this, otherwise it will probably make a decent amount of noise, but it's bare bones, but it works, right? Just ensure you are getting a micro ATX motherboard, or of course you won't be able to fit your full size ATX motherboard inside this. Just to show you the other side, there's not huge amounts of space for things things here, but there is actually a decent amount of thickness. So if you did want to put like RGB controllers or something at a later date, you should be okay. Just be aware that obviously you are slightly limited with space and the quality of this case is fine, but it's not like the thickest material or anything like that. But I quite like the 
look from these like dust filters that you get magnetic sit on the top very easy to filter out if you've got a lot of cat hair or something in your house so yeah it's definitely not going to blow you away with all of its features but for the price i think this is one of the easiest budget friendly chassis to actually recommend but of course step one is going to be to turn your case round grab your io shield out of the box most motherboards won't actually come with one of these anymore they're actually baked into the back of the board itself but as this is to say a little bit more accessible when it comes to price this is one of the features that you lose and i don't miss it i'll be honest because they're very easy to actually cut yourself on one of these that's upside down but you just move it into position and then give it a push just drop this down in position and then grab this little bag of goodies that comes with the screws that you need to actually secure your motherboard make sure you've tucked all of these cables out of the way so you don't clamp anything down once you've put your board inside then you can just pick this up and just gently line this up with the back of the chassis so all of those ports go through the holes in the io shield push it in until this middle one clicks into position just like that and then the whole thing shouldn't really wiggle oh you're joking there aren't any standoffs pre-applied beside this little one. Fear not, it's not the end of the world. You just want to grab these black standoffs and then screw them in where it says M. And you want to do this by hand and then tighten them up with this little screw cover thing that you get inside the box. Note that this motherboard doesn't need one here. Now that those are in, we can then re-grab our motherboard and try that again. This should work a whole lot easier this time. So just screw it down into position. And then, in theory, most of your gaming PC is now done. That is your motherboard mounted into your chassis. But, as you've probably already noticed, there are a load of cables here that you connect. These, of course, ensure that all of these buttons actually work as intended. Most important one being that power button. So just feed these through into position and then have a look at the labels on top. So they say reset, HD LED, power switch, and then power LED. Check your motherboard manual to ensure you're putting them in the exact right one. But it does actually also say in tiny little text down the bottom, and it's these ones on the left-hand side that you want to use. So the most important one is power switch, which is sort of at the top right of this block on the left. Power is always on top, and then your LEDs are always on the bottom. And so then, ladies and gentlemen, that puts us in the slightly unusual position of just one more component to go. No graphics cards. And that, of course, is the power supply. This will fit down here at the bottom chamber. And you can't actually get hold, I don't think, of the W2 anymore. This is from EVGA. It's a 600 watt PSU. So it's got some upgrade room if you want to get a dedicated graphics card at a later date. But generally speaking, obviously, all go and check reviews and things on your PSUs, especially at this end of the market. But as a rule of thumb, if you go for one from a reputable brand, you should be OK. But obviously, there are so many to choose from. That's not always the case. But you don't want to find, like, literally the cheapest most bargain basement power supply you can because i wouldn't trust that which is why we're using this one i mean don't forget that if you are building like an rtx 4070 graphics card based rig or something then power supplies you're typically looking like 100 pounds or so so getting one for 40 is definitely a bargain but as always you do tend to get what you pay for they can be a little bit louder less efficient you know the power delivery might not be as good but i've not had an issue with this one so to speak and then just remove these four screws from the back. Then the whole plate should remove and then your power supply will want to go on the edge like that. You do want the fan facing downwards because you've got ventilation so it creates its own sort of loop. But again, if you've got a load of cat hair, do make sure that you clean it out as it can get bunged up. And then your power supply will run hotter and a fair bit louder. Nicky louder. Then you just have to screw it back down. So let's try and feed everything through the back. Give it a spin round, then grab this large ATX connection and feed it through to the other chamber. Doing the same for the 8-pin CPU that comes up the top left. That's the top left of this side, the top right of this one. You can then plug in the ATX to this massive plug at the top right. Then grab the 8-pin CPU that you fed through. It looks a little bit like the PCIe that you'd use for our graphics cards, but it does say CPU on the side, so you shouldn't be able to get confused. But you just want to grab this cable and plug it in at the top left. I've had to put a light in here so you can actually see it, but it's pretty straightforward, it's just a bit fiddly. Oh, and I've also just realised, there was me saying this was going to be like a really easy build, and it is, but you do have this fan cable to plug in, but it's not really that long a cable, which isn't that bad for this particular chassis, because usually you'd have some extra fan headers at the top, but on this motherboard you don't, which means you're not going to be able to sort of get this neatly cable managed because you won't have enough cable length. So your options are system fan 1 or system fan 2, both of which require a bit of 
trailing. So I'm sorry about this, folks, but I have no choice but to connect this fan in over here. Obviously, you can buy extensions if you want to neaten this up at a later date, but then just try and tuck this into the CP cooler a little bit just to hide that cable. Um, obviously, we do have all of these trailing cables, though, to actually stow somewhere. And as I say, it is quite a thick back to this, so I think it's doable. That kind of works, doesn't it? Obviously, you can be as neat as you like, but to be honest, when you're just putting the side panel back on, it doesn't make too much difference. Yeah, there you go, no issue. Right then, everybody, I think that is the lightest gaming PC I've built in a very long time. But that is our, well, completed build. I do now realise you can see a SATA header. That's going to annoy me, so let's poke that down a little bit. There we go. Other than that, pretty much ready to go. Doesn't look like much, but I wouldn't say it looks bad. It just doesn't look like much. That's not necessarily a bad thing anyway, especially if you're going to sort of tuck this out of the way. I don't expect this to make masses of noise. Obviously, it's a smaller sized chassis as well, so you can park this in loads of different places. The main thing is just getting this to work and I guess testing its performance. So we will have to update the motherboard BIOS. So what I have taken this opportunity to do is find an old flash drive lying around the house. You want one that's small, USB 2. USB 3 is probably fine actually, but fundamentally it has to be formatted in FAT32, which a lot of the newer like high capacity drives you find won't actually be able to do. Download the latest BIOS file from the manufacturer's website, then rename it to gigabyte.bin. So including the extension, gigabyte.bin. Then you want to grab your chassis, you want to get your USB, find the USB port that says BIOS on it, insert your drive, grab yourself some power, then just hold down the button for a couple of seconds until you see some lights. And then that should flash, and then I believe when it goes off, we're good. While it's doing that though, I will take this opportunity to grab ourselves a monitor, keyboard, mouse, and of course the PC-centric mouse mat Link to this is down below. Get yours today. Oh, 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 I went downstairs to feed the dog. I thought we'd have something, well, not this ready. There we go, as simple as that. Obviously as well, if you're building this from scratch with a blank SSD, which chances are you are, you will also need to grab a USB flash drive, another one, I know, and install a copy of Windows 10 or more likely Windows 11. Uh, it's really easy, it's free to download. Obviously you will need their license key eventually, but you don't need one at the time of setup. You can do that later. So. Let us get some games installed on this and see how it performs. I don't actually believe this. This is the first time I have ever done this. And I thought earlier today, I've been using this microphone for the best part of like two or three years now. And there's never been a single time I have forgot to press the record button. And obviously that is today. So I've just filmed the whole hour and a half sequence of all of the gameplay and obviously none of it has been, well, recorded. There is this little bit that you can now listen to from the in-camera mic. That's not the right gun. Yes! APU! And honestly, I'm in just such a weird state right now because I just had one of the best wins in Fortnite I have had on an APU, but then all of the other stuff seems to be gone. So let's walk you through everything from the start. We do have the gameplay and we will begin with Fortnite. So we've begun our testing with sort of medium-ish settings at 1080p in DX11 mode. And if I'm honest, the experience wasn't great. For some reason, we were just getting loads and loads of stutter. I don't know what it was. Usually with Fortnite, you get a bit for the first couple of minutes and then it sort of chills out. This wasn't the case. So if you run Fortnite in the usual sort of mode, expect potential issues. I mean, some of this could be down to the fact that the memory latency or the speed isn't as good as some of the other kits that you can get. I, mean, I would expect better performance with better memory, but that completely defeats the whole point of going for an APU if you then have to pair it up with, frankly, memory that isn't actually that far away from the cost of the chip itself. Doesn't make sense in my opinion. However, when we swap this over to the performance mode, which of course was the epic gameplay that you've seen, 
Things really did change. We were getting around about 100 frames a second. We got some highs, we got some lows, and there was still a little bit of stutter from time to time, but nothing crazy, actually, I have to say. I mean, I was able to play that game and it just felt like any other system. It was really, really good, and that is what this APU is all about. As long as you're happy to play a game, that doesn't have the fidelity or is an older title and you're sort of aiming for around about 60 FPS or so, then it is definitely doable. I mean, as I say, emphasis on the lighter or older titles because if you're gonna play something else, you won't get the same results and frankly, you'll be disappointed because this does not have the performance of like a super high and dedicated GPU. It kind of replicates like a budget for anyone from a few years ago, I guess is the best way of describing it. What else did we try? We also tried some Smites, which is a game that is actually coming out with Smite 2 in the not too distant future. And this was another one that ran really well, actually. Again, older title, but is competitive. And I don't think anyone would have any huge complaints for getting anywhere between 150 to about 100 FPS. Depends how many things are going on screen at the same time. But it was a really nice experience. Again, like you would happily play on this system. You weren't getting any stutter or anything really like that. It was, it was good for what was the really budget, like entry level system. As long as you're playing games like that, again, performance was very good. When you're moving on to some other things though, we got very mixed results. I mean, I'm sure CSGO would have been fine, but CSGO 2 does seem to, I'm not sure if it's trying to be too clever, but I was getting a bit of artifacting, like some blockiness from time to time. Once you tune the settings, you can get to get it to sort of a decent place. Just go easy on things like FSR and things like that, because when you're playing at 1080p, the results, can get a little bit messy. Same with like the texture filtering and things. I would advise keeping that turned up a little bit just to make sure you're not getting, as I say, any blockiness, artifacts, things like that. But again, CSGO will run, but we weren't really able to get it over 100 frames a second without like some big compromises to the image quality. It was fine once you got it tuned, but it's not gonna win any awards for like the best experience out there. But again, entry level system, absolutely fine. But then it was time for perhaps the most interesting title in our test, some Diablo 4, because this is actually quite an intense game for one that's modern and lighter, if that kind of makes sense. So you'd expect this to run really well on a broad range of systems, it's got a lot of scalability, and it did run okay here. I mean, the raw frame rate, when you look at these numbers, you might think that it's looking pretty good. But I'm hoping it comes across properly in the video, but again, we were getting quite a lot of consistent stutter as we were sort of roaming about. And this is still a decent CPU inside this, so I wouldn't have actually guessed it was anything to do with the processor or the CPU side of things, more actually that iGPU, which was a bit of a shame because unlike something like CS that seemed to run smoothly enough, but at a slightly lower frame rate, this was, well, running at about 40 to 60 frames a second, but then you'd get quite a lot of like 1% low issues and things, which meant that the playability was fine, but it just didn't feel as good as it should. Something like Diablo, that's actually not the end of the world, and the game did improve a lot once you'd enabled the low FX and turned some of the particle things down, just generally turned the settings down a little bit. Uh, and then again, you had a playable experience, but I wouldn't say Diablo played the best on this system. It'd be fine, it would start you off, uh, but I think if you were like really committed to Diablo, I imagine you would reach for a dedicated graphics card in like a few months time after getting through to this system. In terms of noise levels and things, actually no issues whatsoever. I mean, it was a really quiet system. Temperatures weren't as bad as I would have expected, to be fair from what I'd heard, but again, that's gonna be more like sustained loads. Productivity when that CPU is at 100% where you're sort of gonna run into more of an issue, I suppose. But I don't know, it's still sort of like mixed, really, when it comes to my overall thoughts about the system, because something like Fortnite, you know, it's great. As long as you're happy to play in that performance mode that doesn't look fantastic, but if I'm honest, I think it actually helps you be a bit more competitive because you don't get, I uh, like the shadows and things, it's just easier to see. For that, you know, it's great. This can be good as long as you are playing one of those lighter titles. And specifically, you have to be playing on a Windows PC because guess what? The best gaming solution for this sort of budget is not a PC. It's an Xbox Series X or a PlayStation 5. You know, if you want to save even more, then obviously grab yourself an Xbox Series S. I still think the performance of that will be better than what you're getting here. And you've still got obviously like a huge game library, loads of money for games, all of that stuff, various mouse and keyboard support, but that's not going to help you if you want to play specific, what? That's not going to help you if you specifically want to play something like CSGO because obviously PC, mouse and keyboard, Windows. So it'll get your foot in the door and I 
I think you'll be happy with the end result as long as you have watched videos like this and you know that you're not going to be able to play AAA titles at anywhere close to 60 frames a second at max detail. Just not going to happen. So expectations in check. I would say that actually the 8600 is recommended for the very niche use case of someone that needs that level of performance but really is like so tight on budget that you can't spend the extra 70 80 dollars more because i do think that i can build a better gaming pc for really not much more money at all with a dedicated graphics card get subscribed so you don't miss it because it's going to be coming in the next seven days or so i'm buying some more stuff and when it arrives we will be putting it together but i really would love to hear your thoughts on this and thank you so much for watching this video by the way smash the like button if you've enjoyed it and as i say get yourself subscribed what do you make of our system. Do you think this APU is great? Or are you like me where you can see it has limited appeal, but it's certainly not for everybody. We'd love to hear your thoughts on this, so let us know down in the comment section below. And of course, as always, if you do want to check out current pricing on anything that was featured in this video, you can find that link down below. And I'll also leave a few extra links while I'm down there so you can see what a more powerful PC for similar money will actually look like. And while you're down there, why not check out the awesome AORS G16X. This 2024 gaming beast packs a 16 inch 165 hertz display with Dolby Vision and a pin sharp resolution of 2560 by 1600. Factoring the latest 14th gen Intel CPUs, Nvidia's 40 series of mobile graphics and Gigabyte WinForce Infinity fans, and you've got the gaming laptop of your dreams. It even comes with Gigabyte's AI Nexus software for better performance, acoustics and battery life. Learn more today with the link down below. But thank you guys so much for watching this video. We'll catch you in the next one.